Suzanne Legrand, and this is Disobedient Femmes. Today, my guest is Dr. Indra Viscontis, who is a professor of science and humanities at San Francisco Conservatory of Music and the author of the recently published book, How Music Can Make You Better. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So to begin, I find it interesting that you are both an opera singer and also a neuroscientist. That's very unusual a combination. Yeah. Could you talk I mean, a little bit about how how you ended up doing both of those things? Sure. I mean, you know, I think that um, people tend to think of science and art as being really separate things. But anyone who works in science or in art knows that the fundamental driving force of their work is the capacity to wonder and to be curious. And, you know, it's just that scientists and artists use different methods. So scientists really use the objective scientific method to sort of figure out what is true for all of us. And artists use their individual experiences. And so one of the reasons that I was drawn to psychology to begin with was because it can really highlight what it means to be human. And we can't really do have a deep understanding of that by removing the individual experience from the equation. And I just always love to sing. It's just something that brings me physical joy and emotional release. And so I, I just couldn't give it up, uh, in part because also it just seemed to really inform uh, the kinds of questions that I wanted to answer as a scientist. So I just refused, even though people told me I need to pick to give it up. And then eventually I found uh, a place where both of my uh, educational paths in, in you know, classical music, in opera, and in neuroscience, psychology converged. Uh, and so, so I feel very lucky that I'm able to work in this space, but I actually don't find them that different anymore, even though the actual physical work can be fairly different. You know, you cover a lot of ground in this very thin volume, um, connecting music to neuroscience throughout. And the first thing that you do is you take on a huge question, which is, what is music? Could you talk a little bit about what music is and what it has to do with the brain? Yeah, and, and I will say, you know, this this book is a volume that is part of a a larger collection by Chronicle called the How series, which really aims at kind of demystifying art and culture and making it accessible to people who sometimes find it intimidating. And I think that's one of the reasons why they chose me to write the book on music, um, because opera can seem kind of off-putting to some people. It seems like, oh, it's very highbrow and elitist and the tickets are expensive and you need to like, you know, they, they sing in a different story. But that's never been my approach to opera. In fact, a lot of my work has been about bringing opera to the general public. I you know I founded a chapter of an opera company called Opera on Tap, where we literally perform in bars. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm a, a, a staunch advocate of using super titles so that people can, you know, even if we're singing in English, I just directed an opera uh, called Proving Up by Missy Mazzoli that is in English, but I, I insisted on having super titles because I wanted the audience to understand every word. So, you know, I think that there's this component of my work that really is about bringing everybody in along on the journey. But music is very subjective. And I have very clear memories of people telling me that um, either, you know, they don't like opera or they don't understand opera or they don't understand why other people can like it or they don't like other genres. So some of my, you know, big opera fans will say, you know, I love opera, but I can't stand heavy metal or I, or I can't stand rap or hip hop. And, you know, it's not music. And that to me was always interesting, the sense that you can have the same physical stimulus and presumably we hear it the same way, although the truth is, is actually we don't. Um, and yet we can disagree as to whether it is music or not. 
And so that got me thinking, and you know, there's a lot of now wonderful examples of how music and, and whether we assign the label of music to something really depends on how we interpret that sound. And you know, we, we think of hearing as just being a reflection of what's out there in the physical world. But when you think about it, we have to learn to hear language in a lot of ways. We have to learn to hear a foreign language when we're learning it. And the same way we have to learn to hear music. It doesn't just happen without experience. Our brains have to figure out what is meaningful in the sound wave. And so if you have a lot of experience with a particular musical genre, you will know what the patterns are and what the meanings are. And so if you're an opera fan, you'll understand that certain sounds mean certain emotions or, you know, certain ideas. Certain composers will use certain rules and, and, and strategies to, you know, tell you something really interesting. And all of these layers of meaning add to your enjoyment of music. But if you don't know what to listen for, it can sound very artificial. I mean, here's this person screaming at the top of their lungs. Like, how is that... You know, how is that really natural? And yet for opera singers, it feels like the most natural, unencumbered way to express some really deep emotions. So turning back to this question of what is music, to me it's a really fascinating example of how it's your brain, it's your experience that creates, that pulls music out of sound. And so your previous experience, your mental state, your emotional state, all of that is going to dictate how and what you hear and whether or not you will define that as being musical. You mentioned that there are two periods in people's lives that are particularly important for the development of their musical taste, um, early childhood and adolescence. Can you talk about why those are so formative? Yeah, and they're formative for very different reasons, but both reasons are uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in terms of the neuroanatomy or what is happening in that stage of development. So when you're a very, in your first three years of life, your, your brain is developing very rapidly. In fact, in the first year of life, your brain triples in size, and then thereafter, it only ever increases by about another 20%. So there's a vast majority of growth that's happening in that first year, and we know uh, that the, the child, the infant, needs to have stimulation of particular sorts in order to properly develop the ability to sense things. So, for example, if there's something wrong and they, you know, like if they, if they can't see well, well um, in those early stages as those parts of the brain are developing, uh, if they don't get the right stimulation because you have some you know, kind of blockage, then their brains will never develop the capacity to hear or see, um, use that sense in the way that a healthy individual would. So, so that early stage is really important in terms of just developing the capacity to make sense of sound. So a child who grows up in a very noisy environment uh, in which they have to tune out sound all the time just to function, um, will develop an auditory response or a cortical, cortical response to sound that's very different from a person who grew up in an environment where sound was at a premium, where you know things were generally really quiet, um, but maybe their parents played them music in very meaningful moments, um, so they learned to sort of listen carefully and their brain learned to kind of use that information uh, in a very specific way. So that's where the early stages happen, just in terms of developing a brain response to sound. And then in our teenage years, something else happens. For one thing, um, the, the, the hormone levels and the emotional roller coaster that accompanies the teenage years is you know, quite a ride. And it's also a time when we, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, are separating from our tribe. There are a lot of things that teenagers do that annoy their parents, and in part that's adaptive because, you know, they, they want to leave their uh, family unit in order to start their own families. Um, it's also a time when they're making social connections with others, and music is a powerful social glue. Um, we see this in the fact that when you're listening to music, uh, your own body rhythms and brain rhythms begin to synchronize with those of the musicians and those of, of the other listeners around you. And there's also 
higher levels of the attachment hormone oxytocin that come into play. So we actually see levels of oxytocin, um, which is this hormone that's involved in helping us feel connected with others, rise. But there's another side of oxytocin that people don't often talk about, which is the fact that in addition to making you feel more connected with those that you identify with, it also makes you more aggressive towards those that you feel are threatening the ones you love. Um, so there's a dark side to oxytocin, and we see that in music. Um, there are times in which people, if they associate you know, a, a particular group of people with a type of music and they find that group of people somehow threatening, they can have like a kind of angry response, aggressive response when they hear that kind of music. It's not just like, I don't like that kind of music. It's, I hate that kind of music. It makes me angry. Um, and so I think that's, that's also an interesting part of it. But in the teenage years, as we're trying to find our tribe, and we have these emotional experiences, if we experience music um, with others, it can really help us bond with those others and also help us figure out who we are as people. And our identity can be very much tied to the music that we love. And so that's why even when we get older, throughout our old age, even if we have a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease, often the music from that period, that very formative period just after or during our teenage years, can still bring us back to our youth, make us feel connected to others, and we can still love it, even if objectively we can now, with our wizened ears, know that it's actually not very good music, um, but we still have this, like, you know, this love for it. That's an interesting question as to what makes music good. And you talk about the Goldilocks theory of musical preference. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I call it the Goldilocks theory because, you know, it can't be too hot and it can't be too cold. It can't be too hard. It can't be too soft. Somewhere right in the middle. And so we talk about musical preference as kind of following this inverted U-shaped curve uh, where, you know, on one axis you have uh, complexity and on the other axis you have liking. It turns out that music that is too predictable, that is too simple, can be annoying, you know, um, my, you know, my kids, they love songs like Wheels on the Bus or Baby Shark. Um, but, you know, as adults, we hear them a couple times, and in fact, they become super annoying. In fact, people talk about Baby Shark as being now a powerful generator of earworms, which is this, like, you know, unwanted stuck tune in our heads. Um, and so we need a little bit more complexity to continue to find enjoyment in the music that we love. And so as we learn more about a genre, as we become more exposed to the rules in that genre, we actually tend to gravitate towards more complex music, and it becomes more enjoyable. And um, the more you know about that type of music, the more complex the music is that you will find really enjoyable. But there's also get too complex. So if you're really not familiar with a genre and the music is really unpredictable, so I'm thinking of a person who, for example, doesn't really know much about jazz or hasn't really listened to a lot of jazz, going into an avant-garde jazz performance, they can just really feel lost. Um, or someone who, you know, has, has no idea what to listen for in hip-hop or rap, you know, can just find that kind of music really jarring. Or in my own field, people who, you know, go to see the, the opera, especially contemporary operas, which can be pretty complex musically, um, just don't enjoy it the way I do. Uh, and that's because their brains aren't tuned to find the meaningful layers the way uh, people with expertise in those genres do. So they actually don't hear it the same way. Um, it's a little bit like listening to someone speak a foreign language that you don't know. If you don't know anything about the language, then even the simplest sentences can seem incomprehensible. Um, if you know a little bit about the language, then maybe you can follow along with words here and there. And if you know the language really well, well, then you can get lost in the most beautiful prose. And so music is like that. It, it, it has this sweet spot of you will enjoy it if it is just complex enough to sort of you know, keep you interested and, and help you unravel all of those layers of meaning. But if it's too simple or it's too complex, it just won't give you much pleasure. You said something really interesting in your book. You said, I need to listen to or play music multiple times before I can pass judgment. Familiarity breeds preference. So there's a sense here in which pleasure in music is is tied somewhat to 
um, development of interpretation. And on the other hand, familiarity, which sometimes can work against um, being able to understand other forms. Yeah, that's right. So the one universal uh, of music in virtually every music that we now have except music that explicitly avoids it is repetition. And the reason repetition is universal is because it helps us figure out where the patterns begin and end and what those patterns are. Uh, And when we repeat something over and over and over again, our brains begin to listen differently. So there's some wonderful illusions like the very famous Diana Deutsch speech to song illusion where, you know, she says a phrase and, and it gets repeated over and over and over again. And by the end of the series of repetitions, it starts to sound like she's singing it. And um, the truth is, is that that is the way that our brains then parse that information. So if, if something is repeated, either we then ignore it uh, as a nervous system, you know, animals habituate, doesn't matter whether you're a worm or a human being, um, or we start to see other, we start to listen for other things or, or look for other, other ways in which that's meaningful. And so, you know, a repeated word over and over and over again can begin to sound like music. We start to then focus on the rhythm and the pitches and the phrasing and the changes. And so we start to, to, to extract different information from it. And when that information, you know, feels then emotional, then, then we can be moved by it. Um, So for me, especially when it comes to 21st century composed art music, um, however you want to label it, you know, modern music, um, it it often doesn't have a lot of repetition built in. And so I need to listen to it a number of times to sort of let my brain figure out where the patterns are and where the meaning is. And, And sometimes you know, after a couple, a few listens, I don't extract any more meaning and I still don't get it. And then other times, like this opera I just directed by this wonderful composer named Missy Mazzoli, the more I listened to that piece, the more I kept getting in terms of the kind of emotional nuances, the the ideas that she was suggesting, the ways in which the instruments kind of reflected what the singers were singing and and the ways in which the singers were, you know, giving their emotions and, and their thoughts. Um, and so it became much more enjoyable on the hundredth listen uh, compared with the first listen. And so that's what I mean that I, I don't pass judgment about whether there's a piece that I would want to perform or whether it's one that you know I think is 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 that I value until I've had I've given my brain enough opportunities to kind of figure out where the meaning is, what the composer's intentions were, how the performer is is, you know, able to express those intentions and whether I I connect with it. A lot of people talk about the therapeutic uses of music, the ways in which music can help us sharpen our minds and also heal our bodies and our emotions. Could you talk a little bit about the therapeutic uses of music? Yeah, and and I I think there are a number of misconceptions and um, uh, uh, sort of ways in which people can kind of misinterpret the the sort of whole idea of music as healing. Um, There is a whole field of music therapy that is evidence-based, that is focused on specific interventions for specific ailments, whether it's a person rehabilitating from a stroke or a child with a developmental disorder, um, that, that, you know, needs to learn something, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think that sometimes we sort of lump all kinds of therapeutic or healing uses of music uh, into one thing, but I really just want to make the point that music therapy is really its own field, and, and it is differentiated from other types of uses of music by the fact that it really has a focus on being evidence-based. Um, and so... So from, you know, and and of course there are sort of two main ways in which music can be used to heal, or three I should say. One is, you know, just enhancing learning or enhancing, you know, skill or or intelligence or whatever you want to say um, in a person who is healthy. Uh, And this would be non-therapeutic. It would be like, you know, listening to a playlist to keep you motivated to work out or exercise or 
you know, listening to uh, classical music when you're studying so that it keeps you um, aroused. Or playing a musical instrument, learning to play an instrument, a musical instrument as a way of kind of developing other skills. And so, like, that's one category we could talk about. Um, and the main misconception there is that listening to Mozart, for example, is going to make you smarter, right, what people call it the Mozart effect. Um, the truth is, is that listening to music can, you know, keep you aroused, just like reading a Stephen King chapter can. Um, but passive listening generally doesn't make you smarter. You need to actively engage with music for it to show some effect um, on areas that are outside of the, the exact listening, so like other kinds of IQ tests. The second area is um, just giving people music in healthcare settings that helps them relax. So we know, for example, that people who listen to music before they go in for surgery um, often need fewer sedatives uh, to get through the surgery because they are more calm. Uh, so there can be that kind of um, strategic use of music to decrease anxiety, to help relieve stress. But again, that's not really what uh, music therapy is all about. The third is sort of more what I mean by music therapy, which is where you have a particular intervention, a particular treatment um, that is designed to use music strategically to heal. So um, one example, there's some wonderful videos actually online of Gabby Giffords, the congresswoman from Arizona who was shot in the head, and she was shot in the head and, it, and the bullet um, destroyed part of her left hemisphere where her language production capacity was based. And uh, there's some great videos of a music therapist using melodic intonation therapy, which is a particular intervention designed to help people regain speech and um, in people who have damage to the left hemisphere. And the way it works is that, you know, one thing that people realized is that the ability to sing is often preserved in the setting of brain damage, whether it's from, uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases or, you know, a gunshot or stroke. Um, sometimes people can sing things that they can't say. And so melodic intonation therapy sort of piggybacks on this, uh, this, this fact that, that the ability to sing is kind of represented in additional regions of the brain. And so what you do is you, you know, use this tapping method while you're also singing a particular phrase. So let's say the person wants to say, I love you, but they can't get the words out. But maybe they can sing, I love you, or maybe they can be taught to sing that phrase. And that's exactly what the therapist does. They, they take particular phrases and over and over through repetition, they teach the patient to sing them. And then what's remarkable is that the patient can then sing those phrases that they can't get out with speech. And when we look at the brain, we actually see that on the right hemisphere, there is a fiber tract. There is a set of connections of neurons uh, that join these two areas that on the left uh, actually are involved in speech production. Um, on the right, they're less involved in speech production, but they are involved in singing. In fact, we see larger uh, tracts in singers who are trained compared with people who are not trained singers on the right side. And what's happening with melodic intonation therapy essentially is that the right hemisphere is rewiring during therapy to take on some of these functions the left hemisphere uh, really was responsible for in, a, in, in the person before their injury. Wow, that's fascinating. So the last part of your book, you talk about how music can make society better. Could you speak a little bit about what some of the ways are that music actually helps us as a society? Yeah, so I think here it really comes down to um, connections between people. And as I mentioned, music is a powerful social glue. It can help us feel empathy towards each other uh, because it synchronizes our different body rhythms. In fact, when we look at the activation in the brains of people who are listening to music that is moving to them, and we, and we compare it to the brain activation in the people who are performing the music, we see a lot of overlap. And, uh, you know, the more closely those two people resemble each other, so in the sense that if you have two pianists, one playing, one listening, um, you actually see a lot of overlap. And, and so this uh, really comes at the core of what it means to empathize, right? If we, if we think about empathy as being able to put ourselves in someone else's shoes to feel what they are feeling, 
music is really powerful in enabling us to do that because in a sense we are we are in our brains mirroring the kind of activity that is happening in the brain of the performer or and we are also synchronizing uh, our own rhythms whether they're brain waves or, or respiration rate or, or um, heart rate with those around us who are also in, in listening to the same um, music and so I think it can help us find connections in that way uh, and, and sort of take down some of the boundaries that we often, some of the walls that we build uh, between each other. But as I also mentioned, there is a dark side and that we can very strongly associate ourselves with a particular group through the music that we love. And so we can also uh, feel hostility towards a group of people that don't share our same musical tastes. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's, writing by Darwin and a number of other evolutionary psychologists who really talk about music as being something that really is at the core of, of social interactions amongst people. Um, it, it probably, in a lot of ways, predates language in terms of coordinating us. So I like to give the example of, you know, if you think about uh, a couple of our ancestors and, you know, they have to get together to move a big rock. Uh, you know, they'll probably do that musically before they can coordinate with speech, like by looking at each other and saying, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so we know when it is that we want to coordinate that action. And in fact, when we look at, you know, sort of what brain regions are involved in music, a lot of it, especially the rhythm aspects, are related to motor cortex and motor function. And music literally moves us. Um, we don't feel... We don't see the rhythm, we feel the beat. Um, and so there's that, that component, too, where it helps us coordinate and helps us work together. So, uh, yeah, I think it has a lot of power to help us uh, in society, um, and, and it can be used for better or for worse. I mean, I think we're going to see uh, now in an election year in the U.S., we're going to see music being used strategically by political campaigns. Uh, to help people associate a particular candidate with a particular uh, idea or a group or mental set on the basis of what music they choose um, when they come on stage. Hmm. Today I've been speaking with Dr. Indra Viscontis, who is a opera singer and a professor of science and humanities at San Francisco Conservatory of Music and the author of the recently published book, How Music Can Make You Better. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure, Suzanne. I am Suzanne Legrand, and this is Disobedient Femmes. <laughs> 